we talk about energy efficiency all the time. Uh, the problem is, is that we don't talk about energy efficiency correctly. It's a very, very specific term. It's only about the amount of excess energy uh, that is emitted any time you have a single energy conversion. You know, so we can talk about the efficiency of you know, the combustion of gasoline turning a drive shaft. We can talk about the efficiency of a lamp um, and how it converts electricity into light. We can't talk about the efficiency of automobile travel. We can't talk about the efficiency of a lighting system. You cannot talk efficiency when you're talking to systems. What you can talk about is the effectiveness of that system in terms of how it meets its need. And it's a very, very different animal than thinking about efficiency. So one of the things we think about when we're thinking about systems you know, and, and sort of comparing the two, for instance, miles per gallon tells me an awful lot about how the engine of the automobile performs. Watts per square meter tells me a lot about how light is distributed. But miles per gallon does not tell us how, uh, how one deals with getting from one place to another. Watts per square meter does not tell us how light gets to the eye. And those are the ultimate needs with things. And if I can give you something that might make this a little bit clear and sort of looking for an example that's a little bit more tangible, uh, I teach in, in uh, Paul Rudolph's great art and architecture building uh, at Yale. And in 2008, the building was ex exhaustively renovated, actually beautifully renovated if you haven't, haven't visited uh, recently. And after, and a lot of energy efficient features uh, were installed. After the renovation, uh, the analysis showed that it used 17% less energy. Uh, so 17% more energy efficient was actually how it's described. It uses 40% more energy. And it's not because what was done, it, the numbers are incorrect. What it is, it's the frame of reference or the point of reference with those numbers. The 17% refers to what the building would use if it had been built according to 2008 standards, not what the building actually used in relationship to the fact that it was built in 1963. And of course, one of the great tragedies of the building is that in order to make it as energy efficient as possible, all the operable windows were eliminated because it didn't quite work uh, with those numbers. But this is a serious issue for this. That's something that we think is measurable, something that we think is fact, something that we make decisions on, we subsidize, um, you know, um, uh, tax subsidies on, we prioritize, uh, we even sort of like depend on how we solve problems on, is a very slippery number that doesn't have a clear reference. It's not an absolute. Uh, we tend to be, we tend to be very, very comfortable using numbers like this. We tend to be very, very comfortable tossing them about. I, I cannot give a talk anywhere without someone explaining to me that this building is 14% you know, efficient, this system is 25% more efficient. And again, all of that is meaningless when we deal with the bottom line unless you know what that referent is. So this is a real issue. And so one of the things we talked about yesterday, uh, we actually had a lot of drinking and food uh, over the last <laughs> couple of days, so it's, it's hard to say just how clearly we talked about it, um, had to do with the language that we use to talk to the lay public. Well, my question is, is that we don't even share a language when we talk to each other. Mm. And those of us who are working in this field aren't really talking in the same kind of language. And I'm really curious to know what would be an absolute term? What would be meaningful? And I'm responding very much to what Rachel said, uh, you know, when she was uh, questioning Bill. Uh, you know, I think as well about in... Uh, uh, Cairo. I mean, I, I went to Cairo before all of the, uh, the political upheaval there and met with the Ministry of Housing, and they talked about the fact that they had a housing shortage of 60 million people. Uh, you deal with India, and you've got over 300 million people who don't have electricity. So often when we talk about these rosy futures about how renewables will meet all of our needs, we really are leaving out the vast majority of the world. And so we're not also sharing or communicating numbers all the way through. Mm -hmm. So this is what I wanted to put out there. Mm -hmm. Maybe just to respond to that, which would have been my question to you too. I'm teaching a course on building green. 
And so the students are very much interested in the latest LEED certified dorm and all of these things. And we looked at the charts and often the certification didn't mean anything. They consumed more energy, just like the example that you said, but they got points somewhere else. So one of the themes that we came up over the run of the course was to say, well, one thing is to be sustainable by design, and you have all these nice buildings that you can produce, but often taking the old building down and replacing it is actually not at all sustainable. And the students were very interested in places like Havana or other places around the world where they were sustainable by need. And I think that was sort of the sense, and you used the word need, where I sort of perked up and said, well, do we need all this things and the clothes and the stuff that are coming in and that needs to become waste or not. So, but would my students in that case be happy to reduce their consumption? Would they be happy to tend the student gardens, which I do, also over the summer during summer break? No, then there's nobody around. So we visited a, a, um, an old farmhouse to see how vernacular architecture actually uses it and they showed us the traditional farm garden and said, well, every uh, summer, the guy goes in and just takes out all the plants because nobody from the community comes back to tend them over the summer when the fruits are actually coming in. Yeah. So I think there's a whole, and this is the, the issue of the whole panel here, conference in some ways, it's the culture that you want to change unless you have the need in like Lagos and Havana and all these places where you don't have another choice as being sustainable. So I was <laughs> curious where you place maybe both of you Architecture in that field. <laughs> where, where you place what? Architectural design. How does that come into that kind of an issue when you're dealing with global problems? And well, I think that we have a, a huge issue when we're dealing with architectural design, and it really does come back to these housing issues uh, that we're going to be dealing with. If you think about our conventional systems that, as a Western world, uh, we deal with, uh, the larger you may, uh, uh, things like HVAC systems scale with the cube of dimensions. And so all of these things we're doing to be 5% more efficient, 10% more efficient, completely subsumed by the fact that all of our buildings are getting larger and therefore requiring much more. And of course, this is what we're really facing in developing countries. So a lot of the projections that we've seen uh, for what's going to be happening uh, with energy due to India and China aren't taking into account that cubic relationship as their spaces increase. So it might be looking like this for the future. It's really more, uh, you know, a much more uh, exponential type of rise in energy as opposed to a linear rise in energy that we're seeing. And so I think the, the challenge for architecture is really to question what it considers to be the needs of the human body. The only reason it exists is for the human body, and yet we do a very poor job of thinking about how we see. We do a very poor job of thinking about how the body deals with heat. And these are the types of things that if we can wrestle with that, instead of assuming it's about lighting the building or heating and cooling the building, but actually about the energy exchange of the body, we have a chance to really break that cycle. Yeah, I just wanted to speak up a bit for the uh, the incorrect definition of energy efficiency that you've been uh, criticising. I'm sure I've uh, used it in that sense in my uh, in my own writing, um, uh, for which I apologise. But I'm, as I say, <laughs> wanted, wanted to mount a defence of my position, which is that it still seems to me an important and useful and interesting concept, which is how much. Uh, what kind of service are you getting? I mean, to put it in economic terms, what uh, economic value, what economic output are you getting for a given unit of energy? And you can call that energy efficiency. Some people might call it energy productivity, whatever you want to call it. We need something to call that. And I know, I mean, the kind of things they were talking about then, as you say, the lighting or the, or the heating or whatever, are sometimes difficult to quantify. Um, but you can do it, obviously, in a market economy. We can, uh, we can price it and we can, uh, we can put a value on it, and then we can relate that to, uh, to energy use. And that seems to me to be still a very important thing to look at, which is to look at economic output related to energy and how those two things relate to each other. And there have you know, been some very uh, interesting trends in that. It's, it's very interesting to compare that across countries, and, and as you say, particularly in some of the uh, fast-growing emerging economies, the way that... Uh, energy efficiency uh, sort of rises and falls, or, sorry, other way around, rather falls and then rises um, as they develop. Um, so if not efficiency, what do we call it? Mm -hmm. Well, I am actually very interested in the fact that the Architectural League you know, chose this title of the 5,000-pound mm -hmm. life. And while I do think we tend to overfocus 
on carbon. It's really a proxy for a lot of things that happen that affect radiative forcing. The reality is, is that 5,000 pounds of carbon is an absolute number. It's a tangible number. It's an absolute number. And we really can begin to think about a comparison to absolute as opposed to a comparison to the relative. So I think that's how we begin to do it. I don't know if 5,000 pounds talks to everyone. Uh, but I, Rosalie last night, and I should have known this number, and I'm embarrassed that I didn't said that, uh, the typical American uses 37,000 pounds uh, okay, more or less, 37,000 pounds of carbon versus the fact that we needed to only use 5,000 pounds. That, to me, was actually a very powerful statement. Yeah, and, and exactly, that's the point, isn't it? Which is as soon as you start talking about kind of putting this into the world and to actually uh, kind of uh, affecting people's lives with it, then you have to think about uh, the relative figures, you have to think about the economics as well, because that's about people's living standards, it's about uh, political interests, it's about economic interests, and so on. And that's where all these things come into play. And you, you know, and if I, you yeah, know, sorry, you have, no, to, I mean, you have I, to respect those. Well, I, I think you're putting the, the 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 market valuation of this in there. I think is hugely important. Um, and I, I, I was going to, I'm going to try and turn this around to a, into a question because the the um, when the term efficiency comes up a lot with economists, call it what you will, the Jevons paradox, the the rebound effect, and so forth. Um, and I think this goes a little bit to what I what I see as the difference between wealthy world and poor world uh, situations. The evidence seems to be that in times of scarcity, efficiency is, goes to doing more with less, right? You, you, exactly what you described. I don't have enough, therefore I find strategic ways to make the various processes I'm working with more efficient to do it. All the evidence is, through the last 200 years in wealthy economies, efficiency goes to making more. So we, we've made bigger, we have more efficient engines and automobiles than we've ever had, and yet the cars are bigger, and the houses are bigger. And so I think, and you know, how deeply this goes into our psychology or even our biology is perhaps a question, but I think there are then two quite different strategies. And so efficiency, your cautions about efficiency, I think are aimed right at this wealthy world uh, problem. And I, I completely agree with both your and the, 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 the league's choice of something more absolute connected to lives as opposed to right, some abstract uh, improvement.